Thank you for joining us. I'm Felicity Ezewige. Our coverage tonight begins in northern Nigeria, where Mohamedou Sanusi II has been reinstated and banned as the Emir of Kanu for a second time. The coronation of the former CBN governor, Central Bank of Nigeria's governor, as the 16th Emir took place on Friday at the Kanu State Government House. Governor Abba Yusuf reinstated him right after signing the Kanu State Emirate Council Repeal Bill 2024 into law. The State Assembly had passed the amended Kanu State Emirate Council Repeal Bill 2024. The law repealed the 2019 version, which balkanized the Kanu Emirate into five jurisdictions and was relied upon to depose Sanusi as Emir in 2020. However, a federal high court in Kanu has ordered the state government not to enforce the new law. On me by the Kanu State Emirate Council Chiefs, meaning appointment and disposition law of 1984, and in consonance with the Kanu Emirate Council's referral law. 2024 and supported by the recommendations of the Kanu Emirate Council's King Makers who are here with us. I, Governor Abaki Yusuf of Kano State, have the singular pleasure to confirm the appointment of Sanusi Lamido and Minu Sanusi as the Emir of Kano and the head of Kano. In the meantime, the 16th Emir of Kano, Mohammed Sanusi II, has attributed his reinstatement to the intervention and will of God. At an event on Friday to receive the appointment later from Governor Yusuf, Emir Sanusi said his reinstatement was divine. He also thanked the governor and members of the Kanu State House of Assembly, whom he said were a, on a rescue mission by reinstating him. The Emir was reinstated on Thursday and received his appointment later on Friday, following Governor Abba Yusuf signing of the Kanu State Emirate Council Repeal Bill 2024 into law. The move led to his reinstatement four years after the immediate past governor of Kanu, Abdullahi Ganduje deposed him. Meanwhile, a group of concerned citizens and stakeholders across the country gathered on Friday at the presidential villa, calling in President Bola Tinubu to intervene in the ongoing crisis affecting Kanu Emirate. The group also visited the National Assembly over the same matter. The protesters, who marched peacefully, carried signs and banners expressing their concerns about the escalating situation in Kanu. They urged President Tinubu to use his good office to resolve the crisis and ensure the restoration of peace and stability in the state. Under the auspices of the concerned patriots of Nigeria, the group condemns the actions of the Kanu state governor for dissolving the five Emirate Councils and reinstating Muhammad the Sadisi II as the Emir of Kanu. The concerned patriot of Nigeria, CPN, therefore condemn the actions of Kanu state governor. The governor's choice of action flies in the face of reasons and has no place in sane and civilized society. We urge Governor Yusuf to retrace his steps and stop further undermining the peace of Kano State and, by implication, the peace of the nation Nigeria. We also, have, we also condemn the new Nigerian People's Party, NNPP, dominated Kano State House of Assembly that they have cemented their place as a conclave of shame to have reverted into a mere rubber stamp for the mega megalomanic tantrums of the state governor. They, alongside Governor Yusuf, have taken their desperation to an extent that could set the ancient city of Kanu on fire and cause breaches in the land. The President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to call Governor Yusuf to order since the provocation he is causing in Kanu state could affect the entire country Nigeria.
journalist and public affairs analyst Ishmael Awal joins me now for a conversation on this. Thank you very much for giving us your time. Let's begin with your expectations. Did you see this coming, uh, the Sanusi being reinstated after four years? And what's your thinking on the new law? Oh, th thank you very much for, for having me. Actually, whoever is closing the development very closely will have seen Sunusi coming back as the Emir at the 16th Emir of Khan. Because uh, even in uh, the year 2021, during the 16th, 68th birthday of the, uh, Emir Muhammad Sunusi II, Abba made a pledge that when he becomes the governor of Kano, he's going to reinstate Muhammad Sunusi II as the, as the, as the 16th Emir. And he's also going to make sure that all the uh, five new, four new created emirate has been turned into one. And even during some of his campaign activities, he has he, he keep mentioning that he's going to he's going to return to say as an emir. I think what would have surprised people would be the time it even take for him to to do that because uh, virtually it took him almost a year after becoming the governor. To the states to Islam, the Muhammad is the second as the 16th Emir of Khan. What are the key contributing uh, factors to the Emir's initial dethronement, and what can you tell us about this decision? What led to him being dethroned, and his, in contrast to his recent reinstatement? Well, as some of the stories flying around, which still nobody is providing any evidence, is uh, the uh, Muhammad Sunusi II in the in the 2019 election supported uh, uh, Abba Kabir Yusuf instead of uh, Governor Abdullah Umar Ganduja, who was his employer. And then Abdullah Umar Umar, Umar Ganduja also, as so many times said. Uh, uh, Emir Muhammad Sunusi II has been subservient to him as his employee. And for this reason, and also uh, we all know that uh, a corruption case that was not finished was opened against the Emir. And for this reason, uh, the State of, of, of Assembly claimed to have received a petition from a group that wants to Islam Muhammad Sunusi II to remove as an Emir. And they sat down. And I can form a bill and, and send for the for the for the governor to assent, which the oil the into trust, and that's how Sunusi the Sunusi Muhammad Sunusi II was removed as the 14th Emir of Kano State, and other four emirates were created. Um, there's already reactions. We saw protests today um, at the National Assembly about what the, they described as the security situation in the Emirate. Um, do you expect that? there will be more court cases in this matter. And how do you expect those that have been deposed to react? We know that during mm -hmm. the current the reinstated Emir's time, he also went to court. Well, uh, actually, uh, of course, there's going to be a series of court cases. They have already went to court yesterday to, to try to stop Ab uh, Governor Abu Kabir to uh, reinstate Muhammad II, but the court order, just as the government sees, come very late. The governor signed the, the bill by 5 14 in the, uh, in the evening, but the court order comes only 2 a.m. And the spokesperson of the governor sees, even as of 2 a.m., they only see the court order applying on social media. They did not receive. So I'm expecting, I'm expecting so many court cases to come, to come, to come up. But also, I would like, I would seriously commend how the Emir of Kanu, the Tron Emir of Kanu, I mean Abu Bayru, deal with the situation. Because he was at the airport when he learned that he has been dethroned. And the next thing he did was he asked, since he's not an Emir, he didn't have the privilege of having an umbrella. He immediately asked his slave or servant to take that off. This, this shows that uh, there's a level of maturity from way the way and manner the uh, the, the, the Trump Emir conducted himself. All right, quickly, before we let you go, what are the potential long-term implications of Governor Abba Yusuf's action in reinstating the Emir uh, for the political stability well, and governance in Kanu? The only, 
the only implication we, we can see uh, is it will be in 2027. We have seen people from the quarters of Renu Emirates, uh, Beach Emirates. Some of them, we have seen some of them with social media and some other institutions here in Kano, saying that they are not going to vote for Abba Kabir Yusuf uh, in 2027 for the stating in years 2027 is a very long way, but I think that's the only threat or potential threat that uh, Abba Kabir Yusuf might face, but if he did not manage it very well. Ishmael, thank you for speaking with us. Thank you for having me. The Imo State Governorship Election Petitions Tribunal in Abuja upheld Hope Uzadimba's position as the Imo State Governor in a unanimous decision. Presided by Justice Oluyemi Akinto Osadebe's three-man panel, the tribunal affirmed Uzadimba's election, ruling it in compliance with the Electoral Act. The petition filed by the Labour Party and its candidate, Aitin Ajornu, was consequently dismissed. Uzadimma of the All Progressive Congress secured victory in 2022 with 540,308 votes as declared by the Independent National Electoral Commission. Senator Samuel Anyang of the People's Democratic Party obtained 71,503 votes with Achonu trailing in third place with 64,081 votes. Despite Achonu's allegations of electoral malpractice, the tribunal upheld Uzodimma's mandate. Still on legal matters, the Federal High Court sitting in Lagos has ordered an interim for future of the sums of $4.7 million, 830 million naira, and several properties linked to a former governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Godwin Emefile. Justice Yelim Bogoro gave the order following an ex parte application by counsel to the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, Bill Kisu Buhari. The EFCC had approached the court for an interim forfeiture of the monies of prop and properties under Section 17 of the Advanced Fee Fraud and Other Fraud-Related Offences Act 14, 2006, Section 44, Subsection 2B of the Constitution and under the inherent jurisdiction of the court. The monies forfeited to the federal government in the interim were said to be warehoused in First Bank, Titan Bank and Zenith Bank, being operated by Omoile Anita Joy. Others include Deep Blue Energy Service Limited, Exact Quote Bureau de Change Limited, Le Palm Investment Services Limited, Tatla Services Limited, Rosadul Global Resources Limited, and CIL Communication Nigeria Limited. Glad you're still with us. Six Boko Haram members, including a commander, have surrendered to the Multinational Joint Task Force. Chief Military Public Information Officer of the Task Force, Lieutenant Colonel Abubakar Abdullahi, identified the commander as Adamu Muhammad. The other terrorists who surrendered are Isa Ali, Hassan Modu, Nasir Idris, Abba Aji, and Abubakar Isa. They fled Iswab's hideout in Jubil Laram, Southern Lake Chad. Adamu, who is age 22, engaged in various attacks across Boronu State. Upon surrender, they handed over ammunition and are under investigation. Over 100 terrorists have renounced terrorism since the commencement of Operation Lake Sanity II, aimed at flushing out insurgents in the region. Abdullahi also said since April 23, 119 insurgents have surrendered, calling on other insurgents to embrace peace and lay down their arms. Let's also tell you that journalists in Plato State have been urged to ensure objectivity and professionalism is upheld in the course of their reportage. Speaking during a parley with members of the Fourth Estate of the REM, Special Advisor to the Governor of Plato State on Security, noted that objective reportage cannot be overemphasized if peace will thrive in any given society. New Centrist Chizoba Anyowe was at the Palais and now tells us more. 
Worried about the recent trend in the media where some journalists report events with wrong information, the retired general says such is capable of causing panic in society. Retired General Shippey noted that Plateau is facing a critical period because of the recurrent crisis in some parts of the state, and if not handled professionally by journalists, will degenerate into having a chaos and an unsafe society. The government of Barista Caleb Mudfong is struggling hard to bring in investors, bring in development partners, bring in all sorts of dividends of democracy that will make the life of our citizens better. But when we're in the news every time, uh, being portrayed as a very dangerous environment, a very unsafe environment, those attempts sometimes, uh, you know, become difficult to attain. Addressing the recent violence in Wasi, the special advisor expressed concern about inaccurate casualty reports circulating in the media. He emphasized that these false figures can heighten public anxiety. If an incident happens, please let us try to exhaust all possible avenues to get the actual facts, if we must report it. You remember what happened in, uh, in Wase lately? That's what has elicited this call, eh? you know, to be specific. Online, we saw 40 people dead, 50 people dead. Meanwhile, the official figure is not even up to up to one third of that. On the ground, the the official figure from the security forces on the ground, as far as that incident was concerned, was ten. He maintained that accurate and detailed reporting creates better news. This, in turn, fosters a stable environment that attracts investments from local and international partners ultimately benefiting the entire state. In Just for New Central, Chizoba Anyoni. The National Association of Mobile Money and Bank Agents in Nigeria has concluded plans to head to courts to address the legality of the mandatory business registration order issued to its members by the Corporate Affairs Commission. President of the association, Fasasi Sarah Fadin, halted the directive mandating POS operators to register with the CAC, saying the move has forced the association to go to courts to seek redress. Sarah Fadin asserted that the directive from the CAC violates the provision of the Companies and Allied Matters Act of the Federation of Nigeria of 2004, which explicitly states that the Commission has no jurisdiction over individuals not operating as a company. Recalled that a fortnight ago, the CAC formally commenced an enrollment exercise for point-of-sale agents and operators in Nigeria. To discuss this, we're joined by legal practitioner Babatunde Esa. Babatunde, thank you for giving us your time. The POS Operators Union argue the CAC registration requirement is illegal. Can you analyze the potential impact of this lawsuit on the CAC's enforcement of mandatory registration? Good evening and thank you for having me on your program. I'm not sure what the association meant when they said that the CAC is trying to force them to register. The CAC does not force anyone to register and cannot force anyone to register. The provision of the law is that if you're an individual or an association and you want to carry on business as a business name, a company, a limited liability company, limited partnership, or limited liability partnership, you need to be registered. If you're not registered, you pay a fine of 200 every day. And that's what the law says. That's Kama, the provision of Kama 2020. That's what it provides for. So if you fall into the category of individuals who must register, then you must register. It's not, it's not for the CAC to force you to register. But if you carry on business as a business name, as a limited liability company, as a limited partnership, as a limited liability partnership, then you must register. If not, you, you will pay fine. So if they fall into that category, then they must necessarily register for them to carry on their business in Nigeria. 
Uh, given the concerns raised by the POS Operators Union, are there any alternative solutions the CAC could consider to achieve its goals without requiring individual registration? See, it's not about the Corporate Affairs Commission. It's about the provision of karma, the Company and Allied Matters Act. It says that if you carry on business in the categories that I've mentioned, then you must necessarily be registered with it. Now, the question is, does the union fall into that category? From the name, if it's just an association, then it doesn't fall into that category. If it's just an association, nobody's forcing it to register. But if it carries on business, you know, in the categories that I've mentioned, then it must be registered. And I think it's mixing up the provisions of CBN Regulation 2013 with the provisions of CAMA. It is the CBN regulations, which, which, which was made portion to the CBN Act, as well as BOFIA, which mandates um, members of you know, operating POS to register and not come up. So I don't know if they're directing their anger towards the right um, source. The POS operator industry plays a vital role in Nigeria's financial system. Can you assess well. the potential economic implications of this dispute, considering both the interests of the POS operators and the government? Again, I'll go back to the association itself. Is it very clear in its mind in what it's being asked to do? Because if your grouse is with CAC, when you approach the court, what will you say the CAC has done? That you should comply with the provisions of KAMA, the Company that Allied Matters Act. I think they should look more at the provisions of the CBN regulations and what it makes them to do. It forces them. It compels them. It makes it mandatory for them to register as a business name or as a company for them to be able to carry out their business. I think that's what they should focus on. What are the provisions of the CBN Act as well as BOFIA under which the regulations were made? Basically to combat AML, you know, anti -money, you are talking about anti um, laundering law, you know, you are talking about fighting against terrorism and all of that. That's what they should look at. They should look at the provisions of those laws, that's the BOFIA as well as the CBN Act to say, oh, can they force us to register with CAC, it is not the CAC they should look at. That's what I'm saying. They need to be clear in their mind as to who their grounds should be against. Abantunde, thank you for speaking with us. Thank you very much for your time. The United Nations Children's Fund has set a target to give over 80% of Nigerian girls aged 9 to 14 the human papilloma virus vaccine against cervical cancer by December 2024 for free. UNICEF's health specialist, Dr. Ijoma Agbo, disclosed this during a two-day media dialogue held in Lagos, Nigeria. Dr. Ijoma declared that the HPV vaccine remains a crucial preventive step in reducing the possibility of girls and women dying from cervical cancer, the second most common cancer in, Niger in women in Nigeria. She, however, said that vaccination against HPV had shown to be effective in preventing persistent infection with high-risk types, which are the primary cause of the cancer. This laudable initiative is being included within the country to complement the other strategies to eliminate cervical cancer within the country. So prevention is better than cure. Um, whilst we've been trying to promote, you know, screenings, uh, to ensure early diagnosis and treatment we all know that you know once there's a vaccine that can prevent that condition that is always primary for us as unicef um, our girls are important to us no girl has a right has every girl has a right to life and no one should die from a preventable cause of um, cervical cancer so we're hoping that in the future we have a country that is devoid of cervical cancer. Away from that, in an effort to accelerate the development of Nigeria's Northeast region, the House Committee on the Northeast Development Commission has pledged increased funding and support for the commission. This announcement was made during the committee's oversight visit to Boronu State, where they assessed the progress of various NEDC projects, including road networks and the rehabilitation of a 1.5 billion Naira Alawu Dam project. New Central's Umaru Kirawa completes the report. Zabarmari, Dusuman, Koshabe, and Kadamari are some of the rice producing communities in the conflict affected northeast Nigeria. 
Access road to these communities are in deplorable conditions. With improved security in the areas, the Northeast Development Commission has since commenced construction of the roads. We see our people dying that they are suffering here. Everybody knows. But now, after when you finish your rise, by 30 to 15 minutes, you are in Lejubri. You sell it and you are very happy about it and you come and smile face to your people. So, Alhamdulillah, we appreciate for that. We've done tremendous work in supporting our farmers, in supporting our women. You have done well. We really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 To carry uh, this developmental strike where in the, in the affected states, it's not easy. So we have to look around, uh, use any possible means to attract funding in order to carry out more developmental efforts of the Northeast Development. The House committee members towed several projects, including a newly constructed 40-bed capacity maternity ward at the University of Meduguri Teaching Hospital and Orders, been undertaken by the NEDC. Well, today we are donating the, the 500 water forms, uh, 200 cartons of uh, herbicides, and uh, 100 uh, grinding machines, and uh, spaghetti making machines, another 100. Our aim is just, just beginning to have the roads, and the end of the day is to empower and open up the area. The visit allowed the committee members to interact with locals in the communities and get first-hand insights into the challenges and needs of the region. The road construction is still ongoing in Koshebe community of Mafa local government area of Borno State. And it is the expectation of the rural dwellers, particularly the farmers, that this road project will be completed in no distant time to allow them to transport their produce to end a means of livelihood that was hitherto destroyed due to insurgency. In Koshebe for New Central, Minister of Health, Justice, Housing, Police Affairs and Power have taken turns to present their performance scorecard for the last one year. This was as the ministerial scorecard series continued for the second day as part of celebrations marking the first year anniversary of the current administration. Amadine Uyi reports. It is day two of the ministerial scorecard series. The Minister of Health and the Minister of Justice first gave their reports for the last one year. Now, over the period in our federal hospitals, we were able to execute 201 infrastructure projects. I will not give you the, ex the specifics, but the list is available. Our members of the media can, make, can find the details of those 201 completed infrastructural projects in federal facilities and 179 discrete important equipment that were procured by the federal government across the 36 states of the federation. Within the same period of one year, the ministry has vetted and reviewed 485 contracts and PPP projects to ensure value for money, eliminate corruption, and ensure adequate protection of federal government investments. A total of 574 legal opinions were also proffered during the reporting period. It was then followed by the ministers of Housing, Police Affairs, and Power. We have created over 202,000 jobs currently for skill and, and skill level, and this will be sustained for the next six to 12 months. Cities in Abuja, are this contractor have been mobilized and commenced work to deliver the the housing unit will also sign an MOU with the reputable developers to, to develop 100,000 housing units nationwide. This is a public-private partnership we have signed with them. In the past one year, significant investments have been directed towards surveillance systems. The branch communication technologies to bolster the post is capacity for real-time data collection and response. The integration of forensic technology 
has played a pivotal role in criminal investigations and perpetrator identification. For the first time in the history of Nigeria, we have what is called guaranteed improved service level. It might be for band A today, but no government has ever guaranteed 20 hours of supply, not to even 1% of consumers. But to 50% of consumers, we said, let us start from air, and we have guaranteed service level for band A customers with introduction of cost reflective tariffs to that band. The scorecard series is expected to continue next week. In Abuja for New Central, I am Amadine Uyi. Many thanks, Amadine. Again, scores of anti corruption civil society organizations have kicked against what they described as the perceived use of the platform of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission by politicians to fight their political battles. They said this at a press conference on Friday in reaction to a joint press conference by a civil society organization and a group which called itself Kogites United Against Corruption Coalition. The group wondered why a few Nigerians were not seeing the persecution in the current case against the former governor of Kogi State, considering the anomaly in the unending calls for arrest, mainly by members of the opposition party in the state, in collaboration with alleged sponsored CSOs when the matter was before the courts. According to them, the lineup of lawyers, both at the tribunal and as seen on the current charge sheet against the former governor, throws up the name of the same lawyer standing for the opposition party at the tribunal and for the EFCC in the suit against the former governor. All we are just saying, do the right thing according to the rule of law. No more, no less. That's what we are telling the chairman of EFCC. We don't have anything personal against him. But I'm aware that there are some of our mutual friends who are, go, who are pushing him into the cataclysm which his predecessors are falling into. We don't want him to fall into that cataclysm. That's why we are doing all of this. We are doing this just because we think that he's still redeemable. We can still redeem him. We, we can make him serious in. When he was eventually confirmed, we not only congratulated him, but we also cautioned him that he should avoid the pitfall of his predecessors. Whatever we do, we are all compromising about our regard and our respect for the rule of law. I want to advise the FCC to be very careful of elements like those who In South Africa, President Cyril Ramaphosa promised his late predecessor Nelson Mandela on Friday that he would protect the absolute majority of the African National Congress in next week's tightly contested election. Ramaphosa staged his walkabout in Soweto, the town of his birth, and a stronghold of the ANC going back to the days of the anti apartheid struggle to mobilize supporters ahead of a huge Johannesburg rally on Saturday. In power since the advent of democracy in 1994, the ANC is still projected to emerge as the biggest single party after Wednesday's vote, but could lose its outright parliamentary majority for the first time. Ramaphosa promised that Saturday's rally would see him lay out a plan for victory. Welcome to Business News. Nigeria's gross domestic product, GDP, expanded by 2.98% in the first quarter of 2024. This growth rate is higher than the 2.31% recorded in the same quarter of 2023, but lower than the 3.46% achieved in the fourth quarter of 2023. The National Bureau of Statistics released this information in its GDP report for the first quarter of 2024 on Friday. China National Offshore Oil Corporation, CNOOC, a state-run oil company, announced on Friday that it has entered into oil exploration and production concession contracts with Mozambique's Energy Ministry and National Energy Company, ENH. 
The contracts cover five offshore blocks in Mozambique's waters, spanning an area of approximately 29,000 square kilometers, that's 11,200 square miles, with water depths ranging from 500 meters to 2,500 meters. The initial exploration phase will last four years, with five subsidiaries of CNOOC acting as operators during the exploration and development stages, holding independent operator rights and interests. ENH will retain non-operating interest in the project. And finally, Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, Saudi Aramco, and South Africa Sasso Limited are considering bids for Shell's downstream assets in South Africa. The potential value of the business is estimated to be over $800 million. A spokesperson from Shell confirmed that they have been approached by several reputable parties, but they are currently unable to disclose the identities of these parties. That's a package on business news at this time. Thank you for watching. I am Perpetua Fasome Peter. The news continues shortly. Bye for now. In the world of sport, the 10th edition of the Okwekwe International 10 km race will hold tomorrow, Saturday, in Okwekwe Town, Edo State, Nigeria. 2023 presidential candidate Omoyele Shore is also expected to compete at the event. Winners in both the men and women's category would go home with 15,000 US dollars, while second and third place finishers will be rewarded with 8,000 and 5,000 US dollars, respectively, with fourth and fifth going home with 3,000 and 2,000 US dollars, respectively. For the top Nigerian elite athletes, a 500,000 naira will go to the highest placed. Second and fifth place will be rewarded with 300, 200, 120 and 80,000 Naira, respectively. Athletes who set an African and world record will be eligible for a special award of 5,000 and 2,000 US dollars, respectively. The Okwepa race 10 km course record stands at 28 minutes and 28 seconds for men, set last year by Kenya's Daniel Samu Egbenyo, and 32 minutes 41 seconds for women, set in 2014 by Ethiopia's Wude Ayeleo. Nigeria's head coach, Finidi George, has named a squad of 23 players, including the standouts Adimola Lukman, reigning African Player of the Year, Victor Osime, and Afghan 2023 Revelation goalkeeper, Stanley Wabali, to compete in the upcoming 2026 FIFA World Cup to qualify matches against South Africa Bafana Bafana and the Cheetahs of Benin Republic. 16 players will finish runners-up in Côte d'Ivoire make the squad. George's selection also features a recall, for goalkeeper Maduka Okoye and the draw of midfielder Wilfred Ndidi and Victor Boniface who missed out in the last African Cup of Nations due to injury. There is also a maiden colour for Remo Star's right fullback Sadiq Ismail. Additionally, Turkish-based midfielder Fikayo Bashiru by Leverkusen's Nathan Teller as well as Tanzania-based Benjamin Tanimu. Nigeria will face South Africa at the Goswila Pabio Stadium in Uyo on Friday, June 7th with the match kicking off at 8 p.m. Following this, the team would travel to Abidjan to take on Benin Republic at the Stade Felix Hufuerboni Stadium on Monday, June 10. For the second time, Equatorial Guinea must forfeit two World Cup qualifying games for fielding star player Emilio Nsue when he was ineligible, FIFA said on Friday. The second FIFA disciplinary case involving Nsue's eligibility comes 11 years after the first. The latest ruling was announced just four months after he was the tournament top scorer at the African Cup of Nations, where he was permitted to play by the continent's governing body, Confederation of African Football. FIFA said the disciplinary committee ruled that Equatorial Guinea's first two World Cup qualifying games played last November must be forfeited as three new losses. Equatorial Guinea won both games against Namibia and Liberia 1-0, with Nsue scoring the goals. That put Equatorial Guinea in the last place in its six-team qualifying group for 2026 tournament. It had previously been tied on six points with group leader Tunisia. Only the group winners qualify for the World Cup being hosted by United States, Canada and Mexico. Finally, in the world of sport, Barcelona on Friday announced the departure of coach Xavi Hernandez after the Catalan Giants failed to win a trophy this season. But just weeks since, he and the club president, Juan Laporte, agreed that he would stay in the post. Xavi will take charge of the team's final La Liga match on Sunday against Sevilla before departing. In January, 
Xavi said he would leave at the end of the season. But after a run of strong form in April, he and the president, Laporte, agreed that the coach will stay for the next campaign, with his contract expiring in June 2025. However, the situation quickly changed with the Spanish media reporting that Laporte was angered by Xavi's comment, suggesting it was hard for the financially hamstrung club to compete with Real Madrid and other elite European sides. Barcelona won La Liga last season, but were not able to successfully defend the title in the current campaign. Former Bayern Munich and German coach Hansen Flick is heavily tipped to replace Xavi. In entertainment, Thames recently shared insights into her collaboration with global icon Beyoncé on her 2022 album Renaissance during an interview. She described feeling astonished at the beginning of their collaboration, recalling her team's sudden request for her to sign an NDA before traveling to Los Angeles. She expressed amazement at the unexpected turn of events. Their, collaborations, their collabor collaboration resulted in the single Move, featured on Beyonce's Grammy-nominated album. Thames also discussed her work with other renowned artists like Drake, Rihanna, and Future. Meanwhile, Thames' upcoming debut LP, Born in the Wild, scheduled for release in June 2024, is still highly anticipated. And now away from the continent, Nick Kata is facing sexual assault allegations. A woman named Ashley claims Nick Carter of the Backstreet Boys gave her alcohol and sexually assaulted her when she was 15 and he was 23. Ashley's mother, Kim Weber, describes the subsequent negative impact on Ashley's life, including substance abuse and dropping out of school. Ashley recounts incidents from 2003, alleging that Carter pressured her into drinking and had non consensual non-consensual sex with her multiple times. Despite initially telling police she was 18, Ashley has since filed a lawsuit seeking damages and claims that she contracted HPV from Kata. Kata denies all allegations, labeling them as false and part of malicious scheme. However, other women, including Shannon Shea Ruth and Melissa Schumann, have also accused Kata of sexual assault. Kata has, and Kata has countersued his accusers. The docuseries aims to shed light on these allegations and their impacts. And that's how we wrap up entertainment news tonight. We'll go on a short break and return with the latest on what's trending. Let us now move away from entertainment news and tell you what is trending in our latest stories today. Nigeria's Minister of Works, David Umahi, announced the federal government's decision to revert the original alignment of the Lagos Calabar Coastal Highway, discarding the proposed new route from kilometers 16 to 25. The decision came after presentations and discussions involving representatives of affected telecom companies and Ogun Aja community. Concerns were raised about the potential impact on critical infrastructure like the two Africa submarine cable and a power plant. Umahi confirmed the, div the diversion back to the original alignment at kilometer 25, eliciting applause from the residents and stakeholders. Nigerians took different perspectives to the story on social media. Let us take some of those reactions. Adewale is saying, it is sad that a supposed engineer who parades himself as works minister couldn't run a check on the routes before demolishing people's striving businesses. We are bereaved of reasonable leaders as a nation. Let us know if you share with these thoughts as well on X. Share your, com share your thoughts across our social media platforms at New Central TV. I am Jadewa Simon. And that's all tonight. But before we go, let's take an odd look at some of the major stories. Mohammed Sanusi II has received reinstatement later, been to band as 16th Emir of Kanu. Ex CBN Governor Emefile to forfeit $4.7 million 
830 million naira mansions, among others. Boko Haram terrorist commander, five others surrender to troops in Boronu. And of Nigeria, President Ramaphosa holds rally in Soweto ahead of general elections. Would really love to hear from you. Please send your eyewitness reports to the number on the screen. You can follow us on social media at New Central TV or you can watch live on DSTV channel 422, Star Times channel 274, Apple TV and on YouTube. Many thanks as always for watching. Have a good night and a lovely weekend.